Why didn't the police immediately release all of the body-worn video footage of the incident involving the 16-year-old autistic girl? Now, this was a question raised by lots of people. Why don't they just release all of that footage straight away so that it clears it up for everybody? Now, there's a number of different things to consider here. First of all, the data protection aspect. And secondly, the potential disclosure obligations, if indeed they did go on to charge the girl for any offence, which they didn't, as it turns out. So welcome back to Art of Law. This question, these questions popped up quite a bit in the uh, comment threads. So I thought I'd come here on Art of Law because it's more media related because of the nature of the information that people were talking about, being the video footage. So let's take an overview, first of all, at data protection, what it entails, and then the difficulties that the police might face, to be fair to them. It isn't as simple, the short version is, it isn't as simple as just release all of the information, let everybody have it. Certainly not in the public domain, and you'll find out why uh, in this video. So the ICO has got some very good guidance pages, um, both for the public and for organisations. This one in particular is for organisations in respect of GDPR, the data protection principles, and a guide as to how to apply those principles. Now in short, as it says at a glance here, you can see, let me zoom in a little bit, you can see at a glance there are several important data protection principles that all organizations must uphold. And if they breach any of those, then they're going to be in breach of various data protection legislation, such as the Data Protection Act and GDPR. So let's look at these principles. The first principle is that it has to be lawful, fair and transparent. So there has to be a lawful basis for them to gather the information in the first place, and that includes body-worn video. It's got to be fair, so it can't just film everything, everywhere, everyone with no reason whatsoever. It's got to be transparent. Now this translates into you have the right to be informed that you're being filmed. So for example, if you're walking down the street and the police uh, stop you because they suspect you've been involved in some kind of offence and they just happen to be recording on their body-worn video device. You have the right to be informed that you are being filmed. Now, police very often fall foul of this, at least in so much as uh, videos that I've seen online. People challenging police to say, you're supposed to tell me that you're filming me. And that's right. That's the key of transparency. It's the first principle here. Uh, purpose limitation, moving on to the next one, it stands to reason it can only be used for the purpose that it was recorded in the first place. Data minimization, they, they should only capture and record as much as is necessary for the purpose that it's originally captured for. So they can't just record everything just in case. You know, that is a, a fundamental principle. They can't just record everything all the time just in case they need it. And they certainly can't store it indefinitely, which we'll come on to, uh, just in case they need it. That is not a valid reason. Accuracy. Well, in the case of video footage, um, accuracy is, is probably not so much a problem because it should just be a contemporaneous recording. But whereby, let's say... They take that footage, here's an example for you, if they take that footage and they write down your name, but they get your name wrong, or the, someone else's name is, is put down and then they are blamed for being this person. Now, this has happened and it's even made its way into newspapers for which the newspapers have been sued to say that it's the, it's the wrong person. You've published the, the name of the, or the photograph of the wrong person. So accuracy. There's many reasons it needs to be accurate. Storage limitation, it should only be stored for as long as is necessary. Now this isn't defined in law, but it has to be justified. So for lots of legal processes, including um, crime and law enforcement, but also legal advice, uh, we store often indefinitely because we don't know for how long that's going to be necessary. But that is a, a, a judgment that you make as the data controller processing that data. You make a decision as to how long you need to store this information for. For example, if the police, NFA, no further action, an incident, 
which they've recorded some footage about, then um, they should only keep that for a limited amount of time before deleting it permanently because they don't need to store it any longer. Integrity, confidentiality, obviously uh, amounts to the security of that data. It's got to be stored securely. Accountability, someone's got to be uh, responsible for it, and so on and so on. And so there's lots of examples given here by the ICO, which is very useful as to how those are all applied. So that's an overview of the principles of data protection uh, that should always apply. Now, when it comes to body-worn video footage, it isn't as simple as they filmed one person, so either make it public or hand it over, because there are invariably other people captured on that video, and it's their data that is also captured. Now, there's quite a comical comment um, just the other day when someone said somebody's face is not um, personal information, it's not identifiable. Well, of course it is, because it's it's one of the principles that people are identified is images of their face or videos of their face. And they're asked to, in fact, even uh, ID parades are done either by um, photographs or by video to, to show uh, who this person is. Um, but there's uh, another guide called the Safeguarding Body Worn Video Data Guide by the Home Office uh, about this very issue and about how to handle subject access requests. And so if we move to uh, talk about subject access requests themselves, let's move to page 29 first. This is a, a detailed guide on the release of data, as in video or any other data related to video, following a subject access request. Now, for those that are not familiar with a subject access request, Anyone who is identifiable and their information or their data, their personal data has been captured, recorded, processed or whatever is a data subject. And so this is fully known as a data subject access request. So you are a data subject because you are identifiable and any information that could identify you, whether taken by itself or taken with any other information that can identify you is personal data. So, for example, obvious examples, your name, your date of birth, your address, your telephone number, your vehicle registration plate, an image of your face. It doesn't have to be written um, and textual data. It can be image data or video data. So if you make a data subject access request, as it says here, neatly explained, it is simply a request made by or on behalf of an individual for their personal data, as well as any other supplementary information. All that means is the categories of data. Is it high-risk data? Is it personal? Is it medical? Is it financial data? What other kind of information is there? Now, entitlement for this data um, comes under various bits of legislation. Uh, in this case, we're talking uh, about two separate parts, which is part three of the Data Protection Act, for big, because that's to do with the detection and prevention of crime, uh, an Article 15 of GDPR. So the important distinction and the, the long way around for this video is that it is not as simple as just release it, and the reasons will become clear in just a moment. So whilst you are, as a data subject, entitled to your personal data, you are not entitled to the personal data of somebody else. In short, if you are filmed with three other people and you are the person they suspect, you might then be arrested, you might even then be charged, but the other people's data is also on that video. So whilst you are entitled to the, da the data, the video with you on it, you are not entitled to the video with them on it because that would then potentially infringe on their rights of their data falling into well, your hands and anyone else's hands that they didn't consent to. And importantly, that there might not be any lawful basis to process or further process that data and release that to you. Because it's important, um, going back to the transparency, you need to you have the right to be informed that, that your data is being processed, and that includes recording and filming you, but your consent is not necessarily required. It can be one of the lawful basis, but it's not, it, it is not to be a default and automatic assumed basis of consent. The obvious example being the checkboxes on a website. Courts have decided that uh, a pre-checked checkbox for your consent to process your data, such as your email, 
is not acceptable. You need a manual step in that process to provide informed consent. You're told what it's for and you take a positive step to consent to your information being processed. In this scenario, if there is a lawful basis such as the prevention and detection of, of crime, your consent is not necessarily required, but it still needs to be justified. So moving on to the difficulties that we have um, with providing the information. Examples here. Let's say um, subject two is the person who is ultimately charged for an offence, but this video footage here has subject one, subject two, and subject three, then obviously there's a number of different identifying features about each of these people here. And it's not as simple as their face. It could be the jewellery they wear, the clothing they wear, um, any voice recorded of, of each of these subjects, uh, and even uh, tattoos or anything else. And so in order to provide this video footage to subject two, if he were to make a subject access request, the police then need to look at all of this and decide um, that they might need to redact, blur out or pixelate the other subjects of, of whom he is not entitled to their data. Now, this is even more difficult when we get to um, scenarios like this, where the body worn video footage is obviously mounted on the officer in a vehicle uh, and, and maybe approaching a scene. And so looking at this now, the number plates of each vehicle are all uh, identifying information and it may well capture various people along the way. And so in making those choices, the police have to then consider who should be redacted or pixelated or both and then make the decision to provide that information. But also in doing so, in responding to the request, the police would have to justify the response to that request. And if they comply with it, um, they have to go through all those steps of determining who, and that might include police officers if they were not directly involved. They might have um, data subjects who may also be police officers and decisions need to be taken as to whether they are also uh, to be pixelated and blurred out. Um, security being one of the obvious concerns if they are um, involved in, say, undercover operations or currently involved in other ongoing operations and things like that. Those decisions need to be taken. In the case of um, the West Yorkshire Police case, it is not necessarily straightforward, but is more straightforward than some other scenarios in that the chunks of video footage that were recorded inside the house probably did not film anybody else other than the officers and the family themselves. But did the family consent to um, being uh, recorded or for their data be, to be released? And um, were they informed that they were being recorded and all of this sort of stuff? So there's lots of different questions to be asked there. Um, in my uh, Twitter thread, I said that they should immediately make a subject access request. The police may delay it on the basis that I've set out, that they may need to consider all of those things. Were they recording beforehand? Were there, was, was there anything recorded that they need to redact? Was there any uh, confidential information that they need to redact, say, coming through on radios and all of that sort of stuff? There's probably a long process to go through there. And also, if they took the view that it might impede any criminal investigations, then they might uh, delay it for those reasons, but all of which they have to justify. Uh, but it's certainly not quite as straightforward as just provided, and certainly not to make it public. But there was one interesting comment uh, which we engaged with on Twitter, which was if there was a uh, disclosure officer who reviewed everything all the time because coming to the disclosure point uh, as we wrap this up here the disclosure point is if they were to have charged this girl or anybody uh, for any offense who has been filmed during the, that process um, then if there's any material any information 
uh, that could, for the test of disclosure, either be reasonably capable of undermining the prosecution case or assisting the defence case, then that material, or if they're being rely, relied on, obviously, if they're relying on that footage, then all of that will ultimately need to be disclosed in any event, but still may need to be redacted for the same reasons we've set out here. So it's not quite as straightforward uh, as it might at first seem, and the step-by-step -step recommendations in this guide uh, when releasing data on a subject access request um, th there has to be a process in place it has to comply with the data protection act they have to record justifications for redacting and disclosing personal and sensitive data um, the they have to contact the data subject to better understand the nature of the request and manage the expectations regarding the output um, so for example if it were not uh, satisfactory to release the full video, they could release a description of the video, what was said by the data subject in the video, and all of that sort of stuff. It usually will be the video, but not always. Just like when you apply to a company, a data subject access request, they don't necessarily need to send you all of the emails that have mentioned you. They could just send you the data that is within it and the categories that that fits into. In practice, they tend to send you the emails because that is quicker and easier than it is to um, go through and pull out the data. But they will, and they are entitled to redact the names of people that have sent those emails. So for example, if there's two people internally um, having a bit of a spat about you because they don't like you, uh, you're entitled to as much of the comments and the detail within those emails that relate to you particularly if it's inseparable the comments that is from your personal data so if it's a very if it's a short phrase it's definitely about you and they can't separate out the comment from the data they have to disclose all of it to you but not necessarily um and usually in fact not who said it and so unless that's impossible to redact but usually it is possible to redact so they would redact who sent and received those emails uh, of course, it has to be a, a consistent approach to reduction. Um, each case has got to be considered by itself. A frame-by-frame -frame review of the redacted recording to ensure that it complies with the Data Protection Act. Because if you picture for a moment, let's say, any one of these body-worn video cameras captured a neighbor who came out to see what's going on, um, they are captured. If this footage were released without redacting them, their personal data, uh, their right to privacy has been breached. And so there's a number of issues there as well. So it, it needs to be a frame by frame review to ensure that nothing is released that shouldn't be. And of course, anyone wearing body worn video should be aware that people appearing in their recording can request a copy. So using the neighbor example, the neighbor could request a copy because if they are in, in the instance that they appear on the video, they can request a copy of that video. But they are obviously not entitled to the whole of the, the rest of the recording uh, to which they were not involved. So I hope that is a, an interesting overview of the complexities of data protection, particularly when it applies to police and body-worn video, but it also applies to every other organization, every security company that wears body-worn video, every, um, there's separate guidance for CCTV, which is uh, understood to be a static form of uh, video capture, uh, surveillance, it's sometimes referred to because it is static. Body-worn is obviously moving about, and um, when it comes to our personal uh, use of such things, um, there's a, a whole separate conversation as to does it engage the Data Protection Act. I suspect there's going to be one or two test cases for individuals going around with cameras, and there are certain arguments that individuals going around and then publishing it should be subject to data protection, and I suspect that there will be a test case, and I suspect the courts will say, no, that, was, that would be a step too far to make individuals beholden to the Data Protection Act uh, by uh, removing them from the, the household exemption. I think that would be a step too far, but that's a whole other conversation. 
But I hope that was interesting. I hope it was useful. If it was, as Al says usually on this channel, please consider clicking the like button and consider subscribing. And in the meantime, thank you so much for watching.